what's coming up on The World Today. Leadership of Greece's neo-Nazi party, the Golden Dawn, is convicted of running a criminal organization. Still counting the number of White House staffers who have contracted the coronavirus. Plus, the U.S. vice presidential debate will be done with a twist this year as plexiglass is introduced. A warm welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Akaite Afia. More than five years after the leadership of Greece's neo-Nazi party known as the Golden Dawn has been convicted of running a criminal organization. The verdict on 68 defendants was given today in a court in Athens. The criminal inquiry into the party began with the murder of an anti-fascist musician back in 2013. Leader Mikos Mikaliakos and six colleagues were convicted of heading a criminal group. More on this now. Tens of thousands of Greeks applauded and cheered outside a courthouse on Wednesday after the far right's Golden Dawn Party was declared a criminal group effectively banning a radical organization that was once the third largest party in the country. I think the decision was um, correct, was right, uh, justice was done, and uh, I believe that uh, for Greece at least, this means the end of fascism, this means uh, there will never be any possibility for them to rise again, and I think it should be a signal to any other country to fight fascism and not to allow uh, people like those uh, Golden Dawn people to rise again. It must be the end of fashion for all of us all over the world. Golden Dawn, known for Nazi salutes and militaristic rallies, stunned the nation when it entered parliament for the first time in 2012. Riding a wave of discontent over Greece's crippling economic crisis and anti-immigrant sentiment. But it started to unravel in September 2013 when a party supporter was arrested for the killing of Pavlos Faisas, a musician and rapper aligned to the political left. Golden Dawn's leader and members were later arrested as part of an investigation into criminal activity. Golden Dawn fell to win a single seat in last year's parliamentary election that brought the New Democracy Party to power. Meanwhile, two former Islamic State suspects, Alexander Kote and El Shafi El Sheikh, accused of belonging to an Islamic State cell known as the Beatles, have been charged in the U.S. with terrorism. The group has been involved in kidnappings in Iraq and Syria. The men who were previously in U.S. military custody in Iraq have denied the charges. U.S. Attorney General John Demers says the charges are the result of many years of hard work in the pursuit of justice for four Americans who died. Their victims included American journalists and U.K. and U.S. aid workers who were beheaded and their deaths filmed and broadcast on social media. The men from West London were previously stripped of their U.K. nationality. In another development, seven years since the Kenya Westgate Mall attack, a court in the country has found two men guilty of helping the Islamist militants carry out the dastardly act. At least 67 people have died in that assault by al-Shabaab, including the four militants who carried out the attack. They were found dead in the shopping center's rubble. More than 140 witnesses testified in the case, but the accused denied conspiring to commit terrorism. Those convicted today are Mohammed Ahmed Abdi and Hussein Hassan Mustafa for planning and committing the acts of terror, as well as supporting and helping a terrorist group. There was a third suspect, Liban Abdullah, who was not found guilty. The Solami refugee was also acquitted of the charge of being in Kenya illegally and possessing identification documents by false pretenses. The trial is the only one so far over the Westgate shopping mall attack. Wow. 
Well, let's check in on the coronavirus pandemic. Nearly 6,000 experts, including dozens from the UK, have joined a global movement warning of grave concerns about COVID-19 lockdown policies. They say the approach is having a devastating impact on physical and mental health, as well as the society. They're even calling for protection to be focused on the vulnerable. The declaration has prompted warnings by others in the scientific community, with critics pointing out that a more targeted approach would make it difficult to protect vulnerable people. And the risk of long-term complications from coronavirus mean many others are also at risk. The movement, which started in the United States, has also been signed by medical experts across the globe and 50,000 members of the public. The U.S. elections are still weeks away, but the first debate for the vice presidential candidates comes up later tonight, into the night, late into the night for those of us here in Nigeria. And for the first time, things will be done a little bit differently. Vice President Mike Pence and Democratic challenger Kamala Harris will be separated by a plexiglass barrier during their debate. Now, this is to help lower the risk of coronavirus transmission. The commission overseeing the debate made the decision after President Donald Trump and a number of, <clears throat> of White House staffers came down with the virus. Both Pence and Harris have tested negative in recent days, with the vice president working from home as a precaution. The commission also says, as for upcoming presidential debates, the two presidential candidates would be seated more than 12 feet apart. There will be a limited number of guests at the debate, all of whom will undergo testing and anyone who does not wear a mask will be escorted out. U.S. President Donald Trump's health is improving, so say his doctors, but some of the staff in the White House say he has not yet started working in the Oval Office. Speaking to an American media earlier today, White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow says the president did show up at the Oval Office yesterday with extra precautions. He wouldn't explain any further. Moments later, those remarks were contradicted by a top aide to the president, who says although the president wanted to be in the Oval Office yesterday, he was not there as he stayed back in the residence working from home. Meanwhile, the White House senior advisor Stephen Miller says he tested positive for COVID-19 on Tuesday. The latest case of coronavirus reported among the president's inner circle since he announced he had the virus last week. The pandemic has killed more than 210,000 people in the United States, more than any other country. Well, let's talk to international affairs analyst Calvin Dark, who joins us now from Washington. Calvin, good to see you. Good to see you. So what do you make of these changes towards the debate tonight and the upcoming presidential debates? Well, I think if you need a concrete example of the mismanagement and lack of leadership from the White House, the Trump administration on the coronavirus, it's the debate tonight. With the added precautions that the debate commission and the Biden-Harris campaign have put forth, it's Vice President Pence that's pushing back. And let me remind you, he's not just a sitting vice president. He's the head of the coronavirus task force appointed by President Trump. He should be the one... In pushing for more strict um, precautions. So that right there shows you that this administration does not want to take this seriously in the way that they should. Well, I mean, it's clear that the coronavirus has entered the White House. Apart from the Trump supporters who are overjoyed to see the president return to the White House and, has, and hailed him as he made his dramatic entry, what is the general feeling of the American population towards the pandemic, knowing it becomes a huge factor in this year's election? Well, the first thing that I just want to remind everybody about is as of yesterday, four million Americans had already have already voted, including myself. So as we look at the day to day <laughs> happenings, let's remember that it's not just what happens up to Election Day, but that a lot of people have already voted and have already voted now. Now, when it comes to how this will affect it with his um, supporters and his base, I don't really see this changing that much. But for the people in the middle, it's really going to affect them because you know, President Trump said, don't be afraid of coronavirus. Don't let it dominate your life. 
But there are a lot of people who lost relatives, who had to cancel weddings, who had to have their lives changed, have lost their jobs, moved houses, who might support Donald Trump, but they're going to re realize that they're not weak because coronavirus dominated them and that the president is basically mocking this huge challenge that has touched us all. Well, as you did mention earlier, it appears that all of the measures are coming a little bit too late, considering how many people have contracted the virus in the United States and how many people have died. But Calvin, how can America move forward from the narrative it has become the country with the highest cases? And what impact has this had on international relations and diplomacy? The sad thing is, is that there is absolutely nothing that we can do to change what has happened nor to get back those lives of the over 200,000 who were lost and those who are victimized, you know, that are still sick and that will be dealing with this for the rest of their lives. However, what we can do is use this as a lesson learned of what not to do going forward. And in that way, we can make sure that our future looks better than our past. And I think that it is telling that the White House, President Trump, Vice President Pence are continuing to do the things they were doing before, even to a worse degree, which shows you that either they don't believe those 200,000 lives were, uh, were unfortunate enough and cause of their error, or they're just oblivious to it and are doing this for political reasons. Now, as far as the United States um, position in the world, I do think that if we move forward with real leadership in our country, particularly as a vaccine is developed, we can can gain back that trust with our international partners so that we can lead in that effort. But unfortunately, there is absolutely nothing we can do to change the damage that Trump has already exacerbated this horrible pandemic um, that it's caused us here in this country. Calvin, thank you so much for sharing your views with us today. Please stay safe out there. Thank you. Still to come on The World Today. More wins from the Nobel Prize. This one's for chemistry next after the break. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Regional neighbors are showing more concern about the fighting going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan as the Nagorno-Karabakh border. Iran's leadership has warned the situation, if allowed to continue to escalate, could result in a regional war. The current fighting is said to be the worst seen in decades, and both sides have blamed each other for the violence. President Hassan Rouhani has called for more attention to the situation, hoping he can restore stability to the region. He even warned that it would be totally unacceptable for any stray shells and missiles to even land on Iranian soil. Responding to the reports that shells have landed on villages in Iran, which has a northern border across from Armenia and Azerbaijan. Iranian border guards also say forces have been placed in necessary formation across from the fighting. Also calling for peace in the region is Russian President Vladimir Putin, who has called for the hostilities to stop, saying fighting between ethnic Armenian and Azeri forces was a tragedy. He says he is deeply concerned by the developments over the mountainous enclave, which under international law belongs to Azerbaijan but is populated and governed by ethnic Armenians. The conflict over the Nargono-Karabakh once led to a 1991 to 1994 war in which 30,000 people were killed. The renewed fighting since September 27th is the deadliest in more than 25 years. Russia has, with the United States and France, led mediation in the conflict, but the warring sides have not heeded their ceasefire calls.
The Kyrgyzstan Prime Minister Kubatek Boronov has reportedly replaced by, been replaced by Sadir Japarov after he quit following post-election protests that plunged the ex-Soviet Republic into political chaos. A large crowd gathered in the capital, Bishkek, earlier today to demand the impeachment of the country's president, Soronbay Jeanbekov, who hinted earlier that he was ready to stand down. He, however, called on all parties to return to the legitimate field and work together to avoid the political upheavals of the past. In an earlier video, he accused certain political forces of using the results of the election as a reason to violate public order. Observers say it appears that Mr. Jeanbekov, who was elected in 2017, has lost all influence, but it is not clear who will replace him. The United Nations representatives have firmly opposed interference in China's internal affairs under the pretext of Hong Kong and expressed firm support for China's anti-terrorism and de-extremization measures in Xinjiang at the general debate of the third committee of the UN General Assembly on Tuesday. On behalf of 55 countries, Munir Akram, permanent representative of Pakistan to the UN, said that non-interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states is an important principle enshrined in the UN Charter and a basic norm of international relations. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region is an inalienable part of China and Hong Kong affairs are China's internal affairs that brook no interference by foreign forces. He expressed support to China in its implementation of one country, two systems principle in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. In any country, the legislative power on national security issues rests with the state. The enactment of the law of the People's Republic of China on safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region is a legitimate measure that ensures one country, two system, goes steady and enduring. The VOA's Heather Murdoch is in Goris, Armenia, from where she joins us now. Heather, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, first of all, Heather, what have you been hearing on the ground today as regards to the fighting which has been going on for days at the Armenian and Azerbaijan border? Yes, this uh, battle has been going on for about 10 days, and we've been talking to people coming out of the battle zones today and yesterday. Um, we're about 90 kilometers away right now. And we're seeing families evacuating and we're seeing uh, people coming out of the cities and in the battle zone saying that there is constant shelling and bombing. Most people are staying underground or evacuating as quickly as possible. Well, Heather, can you talk to us a little bit about these mediation efforts going on? I mean, we understand that they seem to be hitting a brick wall and trying to reach both sides, and the blame game just continues. So is there any possibility either side wants peace, or are they just ready to keep fighting until the death? Well, the blame game is very well put, because both sides blame each other entirely for this war. Um, the Azerbaijan side calls the area that they're fighting over an illegally occupied territory part of their internationally recognized borders. The Armenian side calls it a, a independent area that is ethnically Armenian and that they are sworn to protect it as part of their nation. Um, people on both sides, as well as politicians, very strongly feel that they want peace, but both sides feel that peace is only available if their side wins. Well, as can be expected, regional powers such as Russia and Iran are concerned about what is going on over there now. So how badly could the continuous fighting tip the balance in that region? Um, the continuing fighting here could, um, could spread and could continue to destabilize the region. Um, if Russia and Iran get involved more formally, it could tip the balance in terms of strengthening the Armenian side of the battle. However, the greater fear is that this war will become another proxy war like Syria and Libya, 
that pits major powers in this region, like Russia and Turkey, against each other in separate countries, which could destabilize the entire region and be dangerous for the whole world. Uh, well, we will be keeping our eyes on the situation going on over there. Thanks for joining us, Heather. Stay safe. Thank you. Scientists Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna have won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the development of a method for genome editing. Charpentier, who is French and Doudna an American, become the sixth and seventh women to win a Nobel Prize for Chemistry, joining the likes of Marie Curie, who won in 1911, and more recently, Francis Arnold in 2018. In keeping with tradition, chemistry is the third prize announced every year and follows those for medicine and physics earlier this week. The prizes for achievements in science, literature, and peace were created and funded in the will of Swedish dynamite inventor and businessman Alfred Nobel and have been awarded since 1901 with the Economics Award a later edition. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry jointly to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the development of a method for genome editing. Well, it's lovely to see that two women have won that Nobel Prize. That is all for the program. I'm Akaite Afia. Stay safe.